Okay. Hi. Um, well, as you all know, I'm uh, Dr. Heidi Grant. Um, I'm going to present today on the neurologic manifestations of, manifestations of celiac disease. I chose this topic because it. Um, we had a patient that came in a couple of weeks ago who had um, he had celiac disease and he also had MS. Now, one did not necessarily cause the other, but um, I was quite fascinated to learn about, it was something that I was interested in, the neurologic manifestations of celiac. So just as an overview, we'll look at celiac disease, we'll look at gluten ataxia, we'll look at gluten neuropathy, and then I'm going to discuss a particular case study that I found online. So celiac disease, most of us are pretty familiar with celiac. <coughs> it's an autoimmune reaction to gluten. Typically the protein in gluten is called gliadin and that's the one that people react to. The problem is about 1% worldwide and um, it has a slight more proclivity for females versus males, but it's quite, it's very small. There's a higher incidence in children. And again, that might be more because the classic presentation of celiac comes with the gut symptoms. Um, so that's typically what you're going to see perhaps in the children versus a non-classic, which does not have the gut symptoms with it. One thing is 90% um, of people who do have celiac, they have human uh, leukocyte antigen DQ2 and DQ8, 90% of the time. Um, just as an aside for studying for USMLE, I remember this as I ate too much at the Dairy Queen. In terms of the pathogenesis for celiac disease, um, so as I mentioned, the protein in gluten is called gliadin, and that within the intestine, that is deaminated by tissue transglutaminase, and then that may, is then consumed by the antigen-presenting cells, the macrophages, which causes a hypersensitive reaction type four. And then you get the classic triad, the triad of lymphocytes, uh, crypt, hyperplasia, and then blunting of the intestinal villi. So you can see here in terms of histopathology here on the left, you can see the tall villi, you can see shallow crypts, and then you can see minimal number of lymphocytes. But if we look to the right with celiac disease, you can see that blunting of the tall villi. They've uh, shrunk in size. You see the hyperplasia of the crypts and you see a lot more lymphocytes. So some of the extraintestinal manifestations of celiac. So the classic celiac, as you said, is the gut symptom. So abdominal pain, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, weight loss. Some of the extraintestinal manifestations are things like endocrine system will affect endocrine, will affect skin, the reproduction, liver. What I'm gonna be focusing today is on the nervous system. So ataxia, peripheral neuropathy, headache, epilepsy, uh, cognitive impairment and some neuropsychiatric aspects. So some of the neurologic manifestations, the main one to look at is gluten ataxia. So this is classically, this affects the cerebellum, it affects muscle coordination, it affects gait, and uh, affects fine motor control. And it'll be found in about 6% of all celiac patients and about equal, equal between males and females. It's the most common cause of sporadic ataxia. So about 25% of all sporadic ataxics are due to, uh, due to celiac disease. In terms of how patient with gluten ataxia will present, the average age is about 48, somewhere between 48 and 55 is when they'll present. It affects the lower limb 90% of the time and also the upper limb. But what that also means is it happens in, in both most of the time. You also see some eye changes. The main one is gaze evoked nystagmus, but it'll also affect saccades. Saccades in particular with cerebellum, you will see undershooting and overshooting, say versus say the Parkinsonian side where you'll see um, slowing of saccades. And one of the things that's quite pertinent about gluten ataxia, 40% of the time there's evidence of enteropathy. So the gut symptoms. But what's even more important about this statistic is that 60% have no evidence of enteropathy. So that means most of the time they have no gut symptoms at all. And this is something that I really wanna drive home. If there's anything you take from the presentation, it would be this. So I'm just gonna show you, Dr. Stein did show a video yesterday of ataxia, different types of gait. But I just wanted to show a, one here of, of the classic Sailor Baller gait.
So you can see here the classic wide-based stance, the wide-based gait. You can see the lack of control in the feet and the hands. You can also see this patient has got quite a bit of lateral pulsion to the right. She keeps falling to her right. That's your classic cerebellar type lesion. So in terms of the pathogenesis of gluten ataxia, we see mainly what it happens is uh, loss of Purkinje cells. So it'll affect the deep cerebellar nuclei and then the Purkinje cells. This is usually due to a cross reactivity, both with anti-gliadin antibody and then anti-tissue transglutaminase. One of the main ones that is being shown more and more in the literature recently is IgA anti-transglutaminase 6 in particular. So that might be something in the future for looking at screening purposes. And 60% of the time, they do show some cerebellar atrophy on MRI. So if you look at the picture here on the right, you can see that this is right at the midline. So you can see the arbor vitae. You can see a huge amount of um, atrophy, both in the anterior and posterior lobes. The flocculonodular lobe is intact, but you can see a significant amount of atrophy there. And here's another one in the transverse plane. And you can see this patient, it, this was taken, the first one's at baseline, second was 15 months apart. You can see a huge amount of hyperintensity and, uh, in the cerebellum. The vermis, the, is, I wonder if the vermis is even in there at all. Um, and the lateral lobes, there's quite a lot of, of hyperintensity and atrophy as a consequence there. So I'd like to move on now to gluten neuropathy. I'm afraid this is a bit of a whistle stop tour because we only have 20 minutes. So gluten neuropathy is the second most common uh, condition that you'll see in celiac disease patients. 23% of patients with celiac will exhibit a neuropathy at some point in their lives. Again, females a little bit more than men, but again, that could be just the way uh, the division that celiac tends to affect. Typically what's been seen is the sporadic neuropathy and, um, and about two and a, it's about two and a half times greater risk in celiac patients than versus the, the average, uh, the general population. So you'll typically see this as, as we know, neuropathy affects motor, it can affect sensory, it can affect autonomic, or you can get a combination of, of two or all three. So with gluten neuropathy, you typically get sensory motor. It can be subclinical, um, or you can have a patient where they just have lower sensitivity to pain, heat, contact. They can get numbness and paresthesia. Typically though, it's symmetric. And we know if it's symmetric in the lower legs, it's gonna affect the gait. It's gonna cause instability and that means falls. That means disability, that means increased morbidity. And so that the fact that that has in somebody's um, quality of life is quite profound. The only way to particularly to diagnose it would be a skin and nerve biopsy. So the pathogenesis is similar where you have the anticlyadin antibodies, but again, with as I mentioned with gluten ataxia, you have the cross-reactivity in the deep cerebellar nuclei and the Purkinje cells. In neuropathy, it's affecting axonal degeneration. But what's found is this is secondary to inflammatory vasculopathy. And this is also the case with ataxia. It seems to be vasculopathy, a vasculitis, as opposed to just a pure immunological response. There's even some um, aspects where um, some studies that might show there's even hypoperfusion of the brain. That is one of the reasons causing some of the neurological symptoms that we see in celiac patients. So, but back to neuropathy. So one of the things that's quite pertinent to remember as well is that there's absence of malabsorption. So even if you take B12, folate, and you take any kind of nutritional deficiency out of the picture, you still will see gluten neuropathy. One of the studies found that I've quoted the, the references below, they noted a decrease in sural sensory nerve action potential. And what was quite fascinating is once they put the patients on a gluten-free diet, that actually caused uh, a back, an, a, an increase again in the sural SNAP, which is quite profound. Again, we find loss of myelinated fibers as well with this. So moving on to epilepsy, uh, there's about a 5.5% prevalence in uh, celiac disease patients. So the risk compared to the general population is about one and a half times. And it's particularly um, um, uh, associated with temporal lobe epilepsy with hippocampal sclerosis. 
this seems to be the type of epilepsy that's associated with CD. Headaches uh, that are caused by uh, celiac or that are also sometimes referred in literature as gluten encephalopathy. This can affect about 26% of celiac patients and it's episodic, so it's very similar to migraines. And uh, they have about a four times the risk um, of getting it compared to the general population and 2.5 times uh, in terms of increased risk in terms of increased frequency versus the general population. So this can be something that's quite debilitating for uh, celiac patients. Again, same picture as what we were seeing with uh, neuropathy and with ataxia is that we're seeing vascular inflammation. And again, as I mentioned before, this can happen with or without enteropathy. So the patients who have enteropathy, they might have this, they might not. Um, so it's one of those things that's very important to keep in mind with for clinicians, as clinicians, that just because a patient does not have celiac enteropathy does not mean they don't have celiac. Headaches and typical as well, typically presents with other neurologic features. So patients typically would get that with something else like ataxia or and or neuropathy. So there's some other neurologic manifestations. Again, because I don't have time to mention all, I just thought I'd mention them. Cognitive dysfunction. So one thing that celiac patients can often describe, often will describe as something called brain fog. And this is something that can affect, can be affected uh, with those who get the extra intestinal uh, manifestations of, of celiac. Depression, anxiety, and eating disorders are also associated, but I do question this just because there's a lot about, about the, con the connection with them, but how much of this is due to all of a sudden people needing to adhere to a, a very strict diet. We know a lot of more about celiac and about gluten-free diets these days, but you can imagine the effect of someone, say a teenager being diagnosed with celiac, all of a sudden not being able to eat their favorite foods, how that can affect their depression, and anxiety. And we know that any time where you eliminate certain foods, you can, there's a proclivity towards an eating disorder. So um, they're just pointing out that these are associated, but maybe not necessarily causative. It's a case of chicken versus the egg. Uh, celiac is also uh, linked with ADHD and with autism. <clears throat> so management is simple, but not easy. Management is classically the gluten-free diet. I think it's easier these days because people are, there's a lot more awareness. Uh, a lot of supermarkets carry uh, gluten-free foods. It's easier to get these things. Restaurants tend to be a lot more aware. However, uh, this is where, as uh, as clinicians, this is really where, if we have patients that are gluten that have are gluten intolerant, celiac, this is where we really need the multidisciplinary team. We need the help of the dietitian. We need help with the psychologist. We need help from specialist nurses to really help patients um, adapt a gluten-free diet and stick to it. What we know in the literature is that there is, to a degree, there is a dose-response relationship. So the closer people maintain a gluten-free diet, the better off their symptoms are going to be. But that's not a hard and fast rule. And some patients need 100% adherence. Um, and because the symptoms can be so profound, especially if you're looking at a relapse in terms of ataxia or neuropathy. So this is what, why I say it's simple, but not easy. So there's a case study I found online that I wanted to share with you. So this is a particular case. The patient presented uh, was a 44 year old male with a six month history of right leg weakness right thigh muscle wasting, and a one month history of right arm weakness and difficulty writing. He also had issue with doing up his buttons. So it's affecting his, um, you know, his activities of daily living. No sensory symptoms at all. And with the history, the only thing really of note in his medical history was that he had migraine with aura. And in his family history, there's a history of, there's a familial history of autoimmunity. Uh, particularly in the maternal side. So celiac, Crohn's, and MS were all noted in his history, excuse me, in his family's history. Upon examination, it was noted that the patient had a right-sided spastic hemiparesis. He had the classical pattern of, pyramidal pattern of right leg weakness and mild wasting of his right quadricep muscle. There was also bilateral hyperreflexia, and this was generalized both in the lower and upper extremities. 
and uh, clonus was elicited in the right ankle, and uh, an extensor plantar response was noted on the right, i.e. the uh, Babinski response. So just a few things that are pertinent negatives for this during the exam. The Sarah Baller exam was normal. Okay, no, uh, no abnormality was detected. Sensory exam, normal. Cranial nerve exam, normal. Some electro electrodiagnostic testing was done and the EMG found uh, fasciculations, reduced recruitment of motor units and some frequent complex polyphasic waveforms but the uh, nerve conduction velocity test was negative, meaning, sorry, normal. No abnormality was detected. So based on this, what are people thinking? What are people thinking is the, uh, what's your diagnosis going through your minds? Anybody have any idea? Sounds like an upper motor uh, nerve difficulty because the patient's hyperreflexic. hyperreflexic. Mm -hmm. so there's no, no inhibition by the upper motor neuron. Yeah. Um, there's both upper motor, but also, sorry, please go ahead. Oh, it sounds like more of a systemic illness in some ways. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'll recap. So um, upper motor neuron lesion signs, lower motor lesion signs due to the EMG response and no sensory symptoms. And the wasting also. Yeah. And the wasting. So he's got both upper motor neuron lesion signs, lower motor neuron lesion signs, and a lack of sensory symptoms. So this classically looks like myotrophic lateral sclerosis. Yeah. Is everybody clear with that? Does that make sense? Okay, so I'll move on. So this is the imaging that we did. Uh, excuse me, we, I, di I didn't do this. This is the imaging that was done by the, uh, in the case. So you can see with A, this is the coronal view here. You can see there's some lesions, white matter, hyperintensity in the right cortex, up in the uh, motor cortex um, and into the internal capsule. And then this was done at baseline. And then B showed that it has, this was two months later. B was done two months later, and you can see how much those lesions have increased in size and starting to spread into the right motor cortex. So I'm gonna move on to C in a minute. So laboratory testing was also done. They found mild microcytic anemia with low iron or folate. So we're seeing uh, malabsorption. We're seeing malabsorption at this point. CSF fluid analysis was done with the lumbar puncture, and this was negative. And then HIV and JC virus testing was also found to be negative. So it ruled out a couple of other massive um, differentials. Because of the mild microcytic anemia and then uh, the nutritional, the malabsorption, anti-endomysial antibody test came back, it was done, and then that came back positive. And then because of that, which is a test for celiac, because of that, then a duodenal biopsy was done showing villus atrophy, crypt hyperplasia, and increased intraepithelial lymphocytes. So our classic triad of gluten enteropathy. So then the final diagnosis became celiac disease with neurological involvement mimicking a myotrophic lateral sclerosis. So this patient was managed with a strict gluten-free diet and was not given any medication. Now, typically with ALS, um, uh, Rilazole, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh -huh, is normally the medication that's given, uh, but this was not given in this case because even though it looked, was classic presentation of ALS, um, because the cause was not, they decided not to give him this medication. So after nine months, he re completely regained his right arm function. He was able to write again, he was able to button up his shirts, he still had a bit of residual spasticity, but he was able to walk unaided, which is pretty important for a 44 year old. I think that's pretty important for anyone, but for someone who has so much more life ahead of them and in their prime, that's pretty profound. And he was followed for two, two and a half years and there was no relapse during that time. So if we go back to the, to the imaging, uh, so the MRI, you can see again, as I said, the first one, A, 
was him at, at baseline when he was first diagnosed and they gave him provisionally diagnosis of ALS. B was two months later with significant deterioration. And then C was done nine months after his gluten-free diet was started. And you can see profound reduced reduction in those hyperintensity spots. That's pretty, a pretty amazing response. So just some closing remarks. Some take home points. The main thing is to rule out other causes. The case, for example, that I've just presented to you, it's, it's definitely not a case of when you hear hoof baits here, think horses. With something like this, I wouldn't even think zebra, I would think unicorn. Um, a patient presenting celiac and then presenting with ALS, that's highly unusual. That is very rare. And um, if someone presents with ALS, that would not be my first thought is, oh, let's check for celiac because I think that's just very unusual. But what was so profound about that case is they got the information from the history. As Dr. Stein is always telling us, you get the information that you need from the history and the history demonstrated that there could have been a, a something else there. But it's to rule out other causes. So if you have a patient with ataxia, once you rule out your, your um, main differentials like Friedrich's, like spinal cerebellar atrophy, like alcoholism, like MS, once you rule those out and you've done the genetic testing for those, perhaps the idea would be to look for celiac. And always to keep in mind, of course, as I mentioned, just because there's no um, abdominal signs does not mean, or abdominal symptoms does not mean they don't have celiac. The key as well is early screening. So if you suspect, ce if you suspect celiac and you can test it and you can get the patient on a gluten-free diet, the better off that patient's gonna be, the better their prognosis, the better their quality of life. One of these things, ataxia, neuropathy, these neurologic manifestations have a huge profound impact on people's quality of life, the chances of them being hospitalized, the rate of hospitalization. So if we can affect that um, at the primary level, that can have a profound effect on patients' quality of life. Again, strict adherence to, to gluten-free diet. As I mentioned, there does seem to be a dose response relationship, but that's not a hard and fast rule. And I think the the closest people can maintain the highest quality diet that they can in terms of um, um, lack of gluten is the best. And as I mentioned, if there's one thing that I would like you to take away from the presentation today is you can have celiac without, um, without gluten uh, enteropathy. That's the main thing to take home with this. So we've discussed today celiac disease, uh, gluten ataxia, We've looked at gluten neuropathy, and we've um, taken a, um, a look at a case of a case of a patient with celiac disease that was mimicking a myotrophic lateral sclerosis. And thank you very much. And I, any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Thank you.